Hi, I'm talking to Bill Hambrecht, founder of WR Hambrecht & Company and also well known for starting investment bank Hambrecht & Quist, which is now, I guess, part of JP Morgan somehow. JP Morgan. Okay, so through many mergers. Hi, Bill. How are you? Fine. How are you all? Yeah, I'm pretty good. Just, you know, amazed by this historic day on Wall Street and I thought it would be the right time to <coughs> get your perspective on what's going on and what do you make of it? Well... You know, I think, uh, like any bubble that bursts, the impact is generally much more severe than anybody thinks. I remember when the internet bubble kind of exploded, you know, there it, it probably took almost a year before people really grasped the significance of it and how it affected everything. But I think the market reacted pretty quickly to it because the internet bubble was basically involved with securities that were publicly traded. So when the market went down, the securities were marked down every day, and uh, uh, if people had margin calls, they were sold out. So there wasn't a delayed reaction. It happened because the market adjusted to it. I think what's happened here is that you know the, the real adjustment in valuation has taken place in a market that has no transparency, the mortgage market, the mortgage securitization market, is basically a market among dealers, and there's no transparency on the transactions. There's no continuous quotes. So there's, a, I think, a reluctance on the part of people who hold these securities to mark them down, you know, and, and, and they use mathematical models to, to value them, uh, and mathematical models are usually based on history, where market values are almost always based on anticipation. So to me what this is, is people trying to not recognize the real damage that happened in that marketplace. And uh, as they've been forced to liquidate to get rid of leverage, they found that their mathematical models are not even close to the true market value. The, the big issue is, um, which and I have been following it for a while, that you can't seem to grasp the, the magnitude of the problem ahead because it's been actually a slow motion car wreck and it seems like. And I just wonder if we are actually done or is it more to come? Well, I would imagine there's more to come, but I would imagine that uh, whatever is ahead of us will be accelerated by this because clearly the Fed signaled that uh, they were going to let uh, people, how shall I put it, get liquid on their own. And, 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 and so they're going to have to recognize true market values. And uh, I would think that anybody that has big exposure now is going to be under tremendous pressure to, to, to recognize their losses and liquidate something in the marketplace. You know, another part of the story which doesn't get reported very often is the, the meltdown on the smaller banks we are seeing. Like a lot of regional banks are going under, except I, I was watching, I think, CNBC, and they said almost 30 to 40 banks have gone under because of this crisis. They're all small yeah. entities. And I'm, I don't remember, I may be wrong on the number. Yeah, I think that number's high. I, I've been surprised there have been so few. I think it's like a dozen or 15. But, you know, the, the reality is that the, the smaller community banks and regional banks, uh, you know, their primary business generally is construction loans right. and real estate. So, sure, I'm sure they're going to be uh, uh, affected. But by the same token, you know, we're, we're taking a long look at it right now with our research people because I think it's a great investment opportunity because they're not suffering from big overhead or bad business models. What they're suffering from is a write down of assets. Mm -hmm. And if they can raise enough capital to cover the write down of the asset, then they can move on as a very profitable bank. Mm -hmm. So uh, we think it's going to be a real opportunity for banks. How does all this come to Silicon Valley? I mean, it seems like we are living in a world of our own. Well, you know, it, it, you're right. I mean, 
the, the Silicon Valley has had very little uh, participation in the IPO market for the last eight years. Uh, there's been a consolidation, I think, in the in the IT business, the software business. There's been uh, uh, almost uh, the venture capital world has operated almost in a private marketplace. You know, there's just been so few IPOs. So th there's very little impact because most IP uh, intellectual property companies and Silicon Valley companies use very little debt, if any. So you know, the, I, I think they're going to be largely unaffected. I mean, frankly, like us, I mean, you know, we have no involvement with the mortgage market. Right. How about like you know, there's a bunch of us, uh, you know, the media type of companies, the more consumer web companies, which have huge reliance on advertising, right? And advertising is a direct correlation with the overall economy at large, which is real estate driven and that kind of stuff. So do you think that starts to have an impact out here? You know, I hadn't really thought about it, but because so much of the advertising money that is moving to Silicon Valley type companies is really being drawn by the web. And I would guess that in a period of economic stress, uh, you'd get more and more uh, movement from general media advertising to web advertising, because web advertising is so much more focused, right. and I think so much more efficient. So maybe, but I, I would guess in the longer run, uh, putting pressure on advertising dollars would probably help right. web-based companies. In, in the near term, do you see any kind of uh, pressure on the uh, you know the Silicon Valley ecosystem like slow down in financing or a few companies going under not really you know I think most of the venture guys are pretty well financed uh, you know the, there was a lot of money raised over the last number of years <coughs> but it's been going out very slowly so I, I think the venture business is probably pretty well financed and those venture partnerships are usually seven or ten years, you know, they're, they're long-term money. <coughs> I would think this isn't going to have much of an impact on Silicon Valley as, a, as an operating entity. I think uh, what's going to be interesting is what happens to the underwriting market for IPOs and for follow-on, because that, that is important to Silicon Valley. And, you know, when you think that two of the five bulge firms are no longer either gone or two of, two of them are gone and one of them isn't independent anymore. You know, I think what that will mean is <coughs> there will be fewer underwriters focused on bringing companies to the public unless they're very big. Right. You know, I think that the thing that's driving these consolidations is scale. Uh, you know, what, what's really happened, I think, over the last 10 years is that there's been a tremendous uh, commoditization of the old agency business. In other words, institutional trading dollars yes. have, have moved to electronic trading. Uh, everything's moved that way. So the, the dollars that used to fund research departments and uh, underwriting firms and funded uh, you know, all the, the overhead, all that money is really dropped by what, 70, 80, 90 percent. And so uh, it's forced these big firms into the principal business because that's the only way you can maintain any scale. You can't carry the kind of overheads and the numbers of people that these firms have on agency commission business anymore. What happens to guys like us, you know, one day we want to go public? I mean, clearly, you know, between Morgan and you have Morgan, you have uh, Goldman Sachs and you have maybe City if it survives and you know a bunch of others and that's it but they really there aren't really any smaller players left so do you think it's an appropriate time for for us to start thinking in terms of like you know smaller players like your company yeah I, I really think uh, uh, a firm like ours you know basically has a low and variable overhead uh, so we're more than happy to do smaller deals. So I really think the real problem at Silicon Valley is not that there aren't companies that could go public. 
The real problem is that they're not big enough and they're not profitable enough yet to create a large enough market capitalization to get the big firms interested. Right. You know, the Googles of the world will interest them, of course. Yeah. But, you know, the, the guy who needs $10 million or $20 million and maybe has enough earnings to, to, to justify a $100 million or $150 million market cap, the big firms just, their overheads don't allow them to be in that business. Doesn't it seem all too familiar? Oh, like yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. This was the reason we started Henry Pick with. So Almost, you know, 1968, because yeah. basically the big firms wouldn't do small deals. So we did the Spectre Physics and the Intels and those things. You know, they were tiny deals. No one wanted to do them. So uh, amongst the current crop, like if, you, if, you, if I'm a startup, what should I be doing and what should be that point where you think, you know, I can go public? Well, you know, there's a... There's a really good database that the University of Florida has uh, put together looking at the history of new issues. And if you had to pick out one number that was a criteria between where the odds improved from the investor point of view, it would be $50 million in revenue. Now, I personally don't agree with that. I think what's more meaningful is gross margin. So if you have $25 million of revenue and you've got a 70% gross margin, you know, you're every bit as good or better. So, yeah. but I think you have to have enough gross margin that you can build a business. Right. But on the other side of the equation, right, I try and build that kind of a business, but there are no buyers for that kind of, that, you know, company. Oh, yes, there are. There's plenty of buyers out in the marketplace. Because it seems like the big yeah. fund, big investors, they all want big equities which they can you know, trade like 24-7, the hedge fund culture, which has become so, you know, prevalent now. Yeah, but, you know, we, we've gone out, for example, and looked at the, at the marketplace. Who buys regional banks and community bank stock? And, you know, there's lots of index funds. There's lots of value buyers. There's, you know, there are 7,000 hedge funds. And they're just as, variety, as big a variety as any other category. So... Do you have to go out and find them? Yeah, uh, but that's what our whole system—that's what our system does. We go out and talk to the whole market electronically, try to find the dozen or so quasi institutions that want to own smaller stocks, and in this particular category, and they're there. So you think you'll do more uh, tech IPOs in coming coming year? I hope so. Yeah, we've been talking to more companies. We, you know, what's been interesting in our business is last year we did three auctions and it totaled a billion and a half dollars. So we averaged a half a billion dollars in auction, which, you know, for us is huge. Uh, and the auction does work well on big deals and that's what was attracting them. And what we found is the people we attracted were the Mavericks, you know, Boone Pickens, uh, Thomas Petterfee at IBG, uh, people who really think for themselves, are not beholden to Wall Street, uh, you know, and think very analytically and don't like to leave anything on the table. And, you know, the venture capital community was pretty well banked by uh, uh, Wall Street. You know, people had lots of friends at Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs and everything else. Well, you know, I think effectively they're going to have to look elsewhere if they want to get a good small deal done because I just don't think it fits those big firms anymore, particularly when they get even bigger. I mean, you know, Merrill Lynch, you think, was huge, and now it's part of Bank of America. I mean, okay. You know, it's going to be a huge worldwide coloss colossus, which will do a lot of things very well, but they won't do small deals. I mean, that just won't work in a system like that. So I, I really do think there has to be a revival of the Hambrick and Quist type firms. You know, four or, four or five of them started in the 60s, and we all built a nice business. Right. Have anyone, uh, you know, who do you think is, is close enough to your, your small model? I well, well, we've approached it so differently with the auction that nobody likes us, so uh, I really don't know much <laughs> about what the other guys are doing. Right. And it isn't as collegial as it used to be. But, I, you know, I'm, I'm sure, you know, the requisites are, you know, have people 
who genuinely believe in technology you know, and understand it and uh, have an overhead that allows you to do deals that fit the size that the company needs right. as opposed to what the underwriter needs. Right. So, you know, going back to what the underwriter needs, and which is my segue into the, the big banking sector now, what's your prognosis, what's your forecast for next 12 to 18 months for the U.S. economy in general? And um, is Silicon Valley in, in specific? Okay, well, in general, you know, I, uh, we have a, a, a relationship, an ownership relationship with Alan Sinai's firm. And uh, I think Alan is the best economic modeler out there. He's called this thing very, very closely so far. And, you know, his prognosis is that we're in a long and shallow recession. And uh, he's also hedging himself a little bit, saying it could be long and deep also. But I think what he looks for now is a long and shallow recession where you're not going to see any significant signs of recovery until the middle of 2009. And so that says, you know, I, I think the thing that's probably most uh, ominous about his projections is he points out that consumer spending has grown at, for example, a 3.5% rate in the United States for 45 years. The last 12 months, it's 1.6%. So the, the, there's a shift going on in consumer spending that's going to take time for the economy to adjust. So, uh, you know, we're saying, hey, this this is going to work itself out over the next nine months to a year from an economic point of view. From a market point of view, the market usually anticipates an economic either downturn or recovery by about six months. So we're guessing that the market will start to improve after the first of the year, okay. after the uncertainties of the election get out of the way and a lot of other things. And there are some things that are doing well. Right. You know, when you look inside Alan's numbers, Healthcare is doing well. Education is doing well. Alternative energy is doing well. There are, there are spots that are doing well. What about our uh, you know, Silicon Valley technology sector? What's your prognosis for the tech sector? Well, you know, I think uh, capital spending, as uh, we defined it before for uh, software and hardware, uh, you know, there's so many things happening out there that I think uh, there's going to be tremendous pressure to deliver a lot more for less. I think like the SAS world where, you know, the, the guys who used to have to buy an enterprise system for $5 million can now buy an SAS system for a fraction of that. I think you're going to see that a lot. So there's a lot of opportunity. Uh, and, and, you know, I think uh, short term, you know, one of the biggest spenders and users of technology have been financial service firms. And uh, there'll be a lot of money spent integrating some of these mergers and everything. But, you know, I don't know, you know, there's liable to be an impact there. All right. My guess, though, is that, you know, the the technology world, economically and, and balance sheet wise, is in very good shape. I mean, you know, maybe growth rates go down, but balance sheets are fine. So, you know, companies have staying power. Uh, their their overheads are, you know, largely they may have to adjust some of them. But I, I honestly think that of all the businesses in the United States and how they're positioned today, technology mm -hmm. continues to be as in a strong a position as, as anyone. Absolutely. Given how weak the dollar's gotten, it, it's it's actually not a bad thing, right. and we can push that. And the the problem with that prognosis is that technology doesn't employ too many people. Right. So we have that of that issue looming, and then we also have the offshoring issue, where it is other countries are starting to become more, you know, they're taking leadership on positions in innovation <coughs> also, right. because. I, you know, you and I've been here. You've been here longer. I've been here fewer years than you. We've seen that the technology markets boom in areas where there is demand. The right. so now the demands are in China, India, Brazil, Russia, places sure. like that. 
so it seems like innovation is moving there also so we have that risk don't you think well clearly sure I mean uh, you look at what's happened to the cell phone market and the handheld and the PDA and all the hardware uh, yeah it, uh, starting later uh, China and India for example they don't have to lay all the copper out for telephones and so you will have a much more vibrant cell phone market and but I still think, you know, for there's a particular culture here that uh, drives innovation, and you know the the Googles of the world s still seem to pop out of Silicon Valley. Right. The reason I ask you that is that I I don't disagree. There is a reason why I live here, being an immigrant myself. Um, but I do find that we have a desire on the part of the innovators and a government which is, or Washington, which is actually completely out of touch with the reality of future innovations and it's beholden to special interest groups which actually want to hold back, you know, innovation. You know, you have guys like Comcast imposing limits on internet usage. I mean, you know, how is that a progressive policy? So we have that much of a dichotomy in this country right now. Well, I remember one time when I was over in China CSRC, the Chinese Securities Regulatory Commission, and, uh, uh, you know, they had, they were, that commission had people from Davis Polk and Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs, and I remember really being impressed at the, at their, the level of understanding, and, and when the chairman kept saying, look, we want to look at all the best practices in the world today, we just don't want to import your monopolies, <laughs> and you know, that's right, I mean, you know, new, new companies, New countries emerge and get smart very quickly, and and they take the best there is, and they don't have to take the monopolies. We still have, uh, I think, a climate of innovation. We have a lot of things going on, but we also have companies that have built such a big market share that they start to act more monopolistic. I mean, you know, Microsoft today is a different company than it was 20 years ago. Right. They're defending a market now. They're not. You know, mm -hmm. It seems like you're still optimistic about everything, and including, you know, the tech sector despite today's uh, tech uh, economic crisis. I'm optimistic, but I also think realistic. I mean, you know, our firm is we we've positioned ourselves for a market like this, and we've been we've been very careful that way. We want to be here when it's over. And secondly, you know, from a, a technology everything, you know, we have a lot of interest mm -hmm. out in Asia. Right. And continue to do that because right. you know I, hey, China, India, you know well, I don't have to tell you yeah, that the world out there is developing and growing faster than our world. Right. I do have to ask you. It's been a few, in a few decades since you've been doing this. How do you do it? What keeps you going? You know I, I really have always uh, been fascinated by how do you make something work. You know, how do you, how do you put together a group of people and, and get them to work together so something works out? And I've also always been fascinated by how do you do it better? How do you do it more efficiently? And and so, you know, to me that was what was always exciting about Silicon Valley, that, that they would harness technology to do things cheaper, better, faster, which means higher standard of living for everybody. And I, you know, I, I think now that's the way the world's going. I mean, if you, if, if if I had to ask you for advice as an entrepreneur, what what do you think I should do to maintain the longevity of what I'm doing? I think you should stick at what you do if you do it well, as long as you have the passion for it. Right. When it when you start getting bored, time to go. Take it. <laughs> Thank you, sir. On that note, I really appreciate the time. Thank you.